Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, it's good to see everybody back, you know, and they're all back there drinking coffee. I don't think we'll ever get them back in here, but uh, they're all here and we're ready to go again. For those of you joining us on television, why, uh, if you're ever coming through Tulsa, we got a couple here from Denver today. So uh, if you're ever here, why, look us up and come in for an afternoon of taping. I think most of you realize we tape four programs right in succession, and uh, when they finish three months of that or have 12 programs and we make a separate little book and that's going to be now book number 54 and uh, I guess I had a call just this morning asking how they were available so they're in videotape, audio cassette tapes and the printed page so if you're interested in any of that well you just drop us a note or call us. Also we'd like to again uh, thank our television audience as well as everybody in here of course that contributes and uh, helps us pay the bill. We just appreciate it so much, but more than that, how we appreciate your prayers, because prayers still avail much, and so we do. We covet your prayers, and uh, we thank you for uh, letting us know how the Lord has transformed lives, and whole families will write and tell us, even the kids will write their testimony, how they've come to know the Lord just through that television program. So we just praise the Lord for all that. Okay, I think that's it, isn't it, honey? Okay, let's go back where we left off, James chapter 4. And uh, remember, if you're just tuning in for the first or second time, James is written to the 12 tribes scattered. So it is primarily Jewish, and uh, there's hardly any church language. In fact, I said last time, there's no church language in here. Uh, James, I don't think, makes one single reference to the blood of Christ, to the atoning, to the resurrection, none of that. And uh, remembering, of course, that James is probably the earliest New Testament book written. Maybe Matthew preceded it, but all these little Jewish books, I think, were written early on before they had an understanding of the doctrines revealed later to Paul. So uh, we're going to be comparing as we finish the little book of James and even go on into 1 Peter how it is so completely different, not contradictory, but totally different from what Paul writes to us as Gentiles. All right, so James chapter 4, remember now he's writing to Jewish believers, probably scattered in the area of what we call Turkey. <clears throat> and he says in verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Why, does that sound familiar? You know, I said when we began the study of James and Peter and John, that you're going to find a lot of likenesses with the four Gospels and Jesus addressing the Jews in his earthly ministry. Well, here's one of them. Isn't this exactly what Jesus referred to the Jews in their wickedness? You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is what? An enemy of God. All right, now let's see how again Paul puts it. We're going to be comparing back and forth because I think that's the best way to see the vast differences in uh, what we call the doctrines of Paul and for us as Gentiles as over against what the writers in the little Jewish epistles are saying. <clears throat> Come back with me to Romans chapter 8. We might as well start at verse 5, hon. Romans 8, let's just start at verse 5. Romans 8, verse 5. Romans 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh, the old Adam, they mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, in other words, they've become a believer and the Holy Spirit has now indwelt them. But they who are after the Spirit do mind the things of the Spirit. Now here it comes. For to be carnally or fleshly minded, just like James says, is enmity against God. The two will not cohabit. You cannot have the enemy's attitude of the world as part and parcel of, of God. He'll have nothing of it. All right, 
So the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it, the carnal mind, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You know, I think way back when I taught the book of Romans, and I was probably in chapter 8, I, I gave the little illustration. If you're living in a neighborhood of middle class people who have a halfway decent income and your neighbors are all in the same income level as you are, and one of your neighbor's kids comes and uh, he approaches you and says, hey, I'd like to have a new bike. Would you buy one for me? Well, what are you going to say? Well, you're not my kid. I don't have to buy you a bicycle. Go ask your parents. They're, you're their responsibility, not mine. Well, would that be out of the way? Of course not. Of course not. Now, I'm not talking about some poor kid. I'm talking about someone on the same income level. We would just simply rebuke them and say, hey, I'm not your parent. They're the ones that you ask for something like that. Well, you see, it's the same way with God. The unbelieving world thinks that they can come and treat God like some Santa Claus and beg for whatever they need and expect him to answer. No, he won't. In fact, I think I'm on safe ground that God doesn't hear the requesting prayers of the unbeliever. His ears are totally uh, deaf to that. Now, for salvation, of course, he's ready and willing to save to the uttermost. But see, the unbelieving world has got the idea that they can just sort of tweak God's nose like a Santa Claus and he'll jump to their rescue. No, he won't. And uh, never forget that, that it isn't until we become a child of God that then he beseeches us to come into the throne room with our needs as well as our praise. All right, so reading on now in Romans. So the enmity is not subject to the law of God, neither can be. Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh, if they've never experienced God's saving grace and the indwelling Holy Spirit, they can't please God. It's impossible. They might as well quit trying. Of course, the world would get worse than it is then, wouldn't it? <laughs> and it's bad enough as it is. But whatever, the unsaved world cannot please God. Now in verse 9, you see, and Paul is writing to the believers, of course, and so there he says, but you're not in the flesh. You're not under the control of the old Adam. You're in the spirit. And of course, here's the delineating mark. Are you, or does the spirit of God dwell in you? Now, if any man has not the spirit of Christ, then again, he's back up there. He's an enemy and he's none of his. Well, I think that makes it plain enough. And uh, to a degree, of course, James and Paul would agree in that area that the unbelieving heart following the desires of the flesh are nothing but enemies of God. All right, back to James chapter 4, verse 5. Verse 5, do you think, James says, do you think that the Scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Now, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. This is a small s, and the, the human makeup is referred to as the human spirit. And so that's what James is talking about, see? That the spirit that dwelleth in us, the human nature that we're born with, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Well, of course it does. Now, let's go back again to Romans chapter 7. My, I didn't intend to do all this, and I guess that's why I, I trust the Lord to just give me the verses as we go along, because I can work and work and work at home, and it doesn't fall together. But when I get up here, here it comes. Okay, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Verse 7. Romans 7, verse 7. All got it? What shall we say then? Is the law sin or sinful? Well, of course not. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, the Mosaic law. For I had not known lust. He didn't really understand that old Adamic's nature desiring for lustful things I had not known lust, or that it was sinful, except the law, the Mosaic law, one of the Ten Commandments said what? 
thou shalt not covet. And you know, when I was teaching the Ten Commandments years and years ago back in Exodus, you remember what we said about it? You cannot break one of the Ten Commandments without coveting first. That's always the trigger mechanism for breaking the commandments, is an attitude of coveting. And that's why it is so preeminent in the life of the unbeliever, as you're seeing in these verses. What causes envying? Coveting. What causes adultery? Coveting. What causes stealing? Coveting. What causes gossip? False witness? Coveting. See, you can just go right down the line. All right, back to James chapter 4. Verse 5 again, So do you think the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us, in other words, the old Adam, lusts, and then brings about envy? Verse 6, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Well, that's all well and good, but that's still not Pauline teaching. And then verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, that's ap appropriate up to a point, but you can't do it in the flesh. See, the only way we can resist Satan is through the power of the Spirit that dwells within us, see? And James doesn't mention that. It, this is all in the energy of the flesh, see? All right, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now that's certainly, like I said, that's apropos for us, but we don't resist it in the energy of the flesh. We resist it through the power of the Spirit. Now verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Let's just stop there a minute. How many of you know John's Gospel, chapter 3, well enough to realize what did Jesus say about the unbelieving individual? He never seeks God. But Malachi, now let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go back to Malachi chapter 3. That's the next, just in front of Matthew, remember, the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi Got a wrong verse. Bear with me. Chapter 3, verse 7. Yeah, I was looking at verse 4. That's why it didn't look right. Okay. Malachi 3, verse 7. Now this fits perfectly with what James is saying, see? Even from the days of your fathers you are gone away from mine ordinances, and you have not kept them, See, I mean, the Jews have always had these kind of problems, as well as the rest of humankind. We're not putting the finger on the Jews alone as being guilty, but as God's covenant people, you would expect more from them. But they were just as guilty as the rest of the world. All right, so here we have it. You have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Well, you see, the onus was left on the, on the back of the Jewish people that they were to make the first move and return to God, and if they would make a move to return to God, he in turn would, I guess we could say, would meet them halfway. But now stop at John's Gospel a moment. John's Gospel, and uh, one chapter 3. Dropping in at verse 19. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 19. Now here I think the Lord himself in his earthly ministry <laughs> is telling it like it really is. John's Gospel, chapter 3, drop in at verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And of course, speaking of himself, he was that light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. All right, this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved 
darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. For the, so the point I want to make is that the unsaved person will never seek God. It's just beyond him. God has to draw. But James doesn't express that. He tells them, you put forth the effort. You draw nigh to God. Come back with me now to James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, now let's come back to Romans chapter 3. And again, look at the vast difference in Paul's language and James. Now I have to keep repeating myself, not contradictory, but a whole different scenario. All right, Romans chapter 3, dropping in at verse 23, which I always call the first step on the road to salvation. We have to realize first and foremost that we're sinners, that we are undone, and that we have no reason for God to let us into his heaven. None. All right, verse 23 of Romans 3, For all have sinned, every one of us. None of us have escaped the fall precipitated by Adam. All right, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now here it starts. Being justified freely, without any effort on our part, we're justified freely by His grace. See, you aren't seeing James say anything like this. Justified freely by His grace through the redemption or the process of buying us back that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth, not you. We didn't set Him forth to be a propitiation. God did. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. And faith is not a works. Faith is just simply a trusting of what God has said. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now verse 26. My, the more I think about this verse, the more I love it. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. Not mine, not yours. His righteousness. And what does His righteousness bring about? That He, God, might be what? Just. What does that mean? Fair. Not cutting any corners, not asking for bribes, not doing anything, as we would say, uh, out of the corner of the mouth, but it is strictly fair and just. And in that justness, he can justify the person that tries to do better, as James says? No. What person? The one who believes. See? The one who believes. In fact, I was just sharing this morning with our guests. You've heard me use it on the program. Those of you in my classes, I'm always using if you're on, a, on an airliner. Now, I couldn't with... Uh, with Diane, because she's deathly scared of flying, won't fly anyway, but I couldn't use an airliner for her. But nevertheless, I usually say, now if you're getting on a huge airliner, and Iris and I have been there, and you finally find your seat, and uh, we'll say it's almost to the rear, and you sit down, buckle your seat belt, and boy, after about two minutes, you unbuckle that beat seat belt, you barrel all the way up to the front, you find the pilot, is this the plane that's going to such and such a place? Yes, you're on the right plane. Just go sit down and relax. So you go back to your seat, buckle your seat belt, and within five or ten minutes, all of a sudden, the sweat starts, and you go back to up to the front and ask again, am I on the right plane? Is this really going where I want to go? Yes, just go and sit down and relax. 
Well, you see, that's what people are doing constantly in the spiritual realm. They're just trying to establish, am I on the right track? Am I really going to get into God's heaven? But you see, Paul makes it so concrete that when we trust the gospel, we can sit down and relax. And we don't have to fret and fume. That doesn't mean we sit down and not work. Now, don't misunderstand me. We're not saved to just sit and do nothing. But I'm talking about the assurance of salvation. Once we have trusted that finished work of the cross, hey, that's it. There's nothing more you can do. You don't try to do this and try to do that. You rest in it. And then the Spirit, as we saw in the first half hour, the Spirit will create in us that nature to do good works. All right, so let me, before we leave this now, read verse 26 once more. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness. And in that righteousness, He might be just and be the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Now that's simple. That's simple. But most of Christendom has taken the simple things and complicated it. Unfortunate, but true. All right, let's move on back to James again, chapter 4. So the implication here in verse 8, draw nigh to God, is just like he told Israel back in the Old Testament. Draw nigh to me, and then I'll draw nigh to you. But under grace, that's not the situation. God has already extended salvation freely, and all we have to do is believe it. Okay, read on in verse 8. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. See, it's something that they have to do. Purify your hearts. No, we're not purified. We're purified now by faith. See? All right, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. All right, now maybe this is a good place to stop for a minute again. We were rehearsing it at break time between the programs. Don't lose sight of the fact now that these men, James and Peter and John, are writing to Jewish believers, not of Paul's gospel of grace, but that Jesus was the Christ. Now you go way back to Peter's confession in Matthew 16. You remember what it was? I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, period. Martha, you remember, at the death of Lazarus. Jesus asked her, Martha, do you believe this? And he had just made reference, of course, to his resurrection. And Martha's answer was identical to Peter's. And what did she say? Yea, Lord, I believe thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Period. Not a word about death, burial, and resurrection. Not a word about the shed blood. They just simply believed that he was the Christ. Well, you take the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 7, the same identical words. He says, yes, I believe that Jesus was the Christ. And even old Saul of Tarsus up front, before he had even heard, heard the gospel of grace, hadn't been yet revealed even to him. And after he comes out of that Damascus Road experience there in Acts chapter 9, He's got his sight back, he's been fed, he's been baptized, all according to the Jewish program. And now he goes to the synagogue of the Jew, and what does he proclaim? That Jesus was the Christ. That's all. But you see, then God moved him out of Damascus and to the backside of the desert and revealed these doctrines of grace. But you see, James is still on that same premise. They're still under the law. They're all Jews congregating. And, as I pointed out in our introductory programs, now quite a while ago already, that they were looking for the tribulation horrors to be coming in short order. Everything was in view, and we'll come to that uh, probably sometime yet before the afternoon is over in chapter 5. They were all looking for the second coming, but they knew that before Christ returned, they'd have to go through the tribulation. So all of these epistles, James and Peter and John and Jude and Revelation really, are all preparing these Jewish believers for the pressures and the sorrows and the tribulation 
that was just coming in front of them. And then you remember in my introductory, I said, now here, that was all interrupted, and I'll show how when we get over there. That was all interrupted, and now we've come full circle 2,000 years later, and everything, even though it changes, it's still the same. We now have the same scenario. We're going to have Jewish believers going into and through the horrors of the tribulation. And these little epistles will be their roadmap. This is what's going to give them comfort. And we'll see, especially when we get into Peter's epistles, it's that constant reminder, you're going to suffer. You're going to go through pressure. But don't despair, God is with you. So remember that as you read these little Jewish epistles, that at that time, here in the 50s and 60 A.D., before the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D., they thought the tribulation was right out in front of them, and then would come the kingdom. But God intervened, interrupted, opened up the timeline for 2000, but now here we are almost in the same place. Israel is back in the land. The Roman Empire is reappearing there in Western Europe, and when my next newsletter comes out, read it, because that's going to be my main article, how that Western Europe is so rapidly becoming the power that will usurp the world as we go into the tribulation period of time. All right, back to James chapter 4. I've got, what, one minute left? All right. So, uh, verse 11. Speak not evil one of another. Now remember, he's talking to congregations of Jewish believers who had professed that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ. Speak evil not of one another. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the what? The law. See how plain all this is if you realize it? What's he talking about? Well, the Mosaic law and Judaism as they were practicing it, see? And so they were not to speak evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, the law of Moses, thou art not a doer of the law, which of course was what they were to be. They were to be doers of the law. But if instead of that they're going to be judges of the law, then they're on what? Then ice. Even for those Jewish believers at that time, they were still under the control of the Mosaic system. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.